Now We Are Pope by Martin Foreman. Performed by John Vernon. Anuntio vobis gaudium magnum, habemus papum. Vi annuncio una granda gioia, abbiamo il papa. I announce to you with great joy, we have a pope. We have the Lord Frederick of the Ravens who has imposed upon himself the name of Hadrian VII. Bless you, my children. Bless you. Signor, signor, sono qua, signor. Cosa vuoi? Niente, Zilda. Niente. Un'altra volta, signor. Sì, signor. Sì, signor. Zildo, Zildo, stop. Not here. Not now. Not now. We are Pope. Zildo? Zildo, where are you? Where? Zildo! Dove stai? Where are you, Zildo? That boy. Never here when I want him. Zildo, my breakfast! Breakfast! Colazione! Breakfast, Zildo. (laughs) Breakfast. Il vaso, Zildo, the pot, it needs to be emptied. When I think of all the benefits that boy has, gondolier to a baron, an English gentleman, a scholar, prior of St. George of the Order of Sanctissimus Sophia, protector of the peacock and puppy at Guernville, there can be no higher honour than these. Except one. Pater noster, qui es in caelis sanctificata nomen tuum, adveniat regnum tuum, fiat voluntas tua sicut in caelo et in terra, panem nostrum quotidianum, da nobis hodie et dimite nobis debita nostra sicut et nos dimitimus debitoribus nostris, et ne nos indicus in tentationum sed libera nos a malo. Amen. Breakfast. Zildo? At least I still have tobacco. To work, to work. Which shall it be, Septimus Scaptia or Stephen Sargent? My next great novel or a letter to my patron? The fantastic or the farcical? Or shall we go for a jaunt? It's a long time since I've been on the water. How about Burano? Zildo, andemo a Burano, no? But the mast, Zildo, it's broken. Septimus Scaptia, it must be. My Lord Bishop. There you stand, where I have put you, on the edge of the lagoon half a millennium before the founding of La Serenissima, surrounded by five handsome young brothers. Evidently knightly and pleasing to see, though big and strong and capable, most singularly childlike and unformed, what shall we do with you, Your Excellency? Throw you into the eternal conflict between body and soul? Not today. The body is weak, and the soul is tired. Very tired. Let me turn to my correspondence. When it comes to the living, to the fat and fleshy, to the lean and liverish, the haughty and hypocritical, my strength returns. Who deserves my attention today? 
what quarrel remains unresolved. Only fools fear to make enemies. Enemies keep us alert. A new enemy, Zildo, has infinitely more possibilities for engagement than an old friend. I will remember my first enemy, John Gambril Nicholson, a precocious boy, a handsome lad. I dedicated Tarsissus to him, my first serious poem, and how did he thank me? By stealing my St. William. He not only stole it, he rewrote it. I sent him an uncut diamond, and he returned a polished crystal, all because I did not yield when he tempted me. Years later, I gave him an opportunity to redeem himself. I sent my Uranian essay. He read it and emitted hysterical ecstasies of joy, then told me he had never felt so wicked and swore to give up his catamites' embraces. Ha! A nothing, a hypocrite, a poser. Who was next? The Marquis of Butte? Come to Auburn, he said in that tight, so very English voice of the Scottish laird. Come to Oban, and I will make you headmaster of the choir school, and you will be handsomely paid. I was young, Zildo. It was less than a year after I had been received into the church, and I still trusted fellow Catholics. But what did I find in that grey, rain-swept town? Five indifferent choristers, two drunken French priests, and a pair of incalcitrant caretakers. My patron ignored me. I had no recourse but to resign. I was granted a place in the Scots College in Rome to prepare for the priesthood. See, Zildo, the priesthood, stavo per diventare sacerdote, and what did those red-faced, overfed, cretinous Celts do? They badgered me for debts I could not pay, and vilified me for seeking solitude from their nasal cacophony. Uh, one day, four oafs carried the bed I was lying in, wearing the only clothes I possessed, and threw me out into the street. No reason was ever given. My archbishop maintained absolute silence. Some said I had no vocation, but that was the gossip of my fellow students, immature cubs mostly, hybrid larrikins given to false quantities. The case remains a mystery to me. I went back to Scotland. I had nowhere else to go. I tutored two handsome boys in Aberdeen until their aunt took against me just because I took their photographs in classical religious pose. Young San Sebastians, martyrs to the faith. Their loincloths were clean. Then an honest priest offered assistance, but his bishop overruled him. I was forced to seek lodgings and menial labour. I had skills to offer, but no one recognised them. I had invented. Did you know this, Zildo? Listen, understand fully the extent of your master's talents. I had invented new forms of photography. Pictures in colour, Zildo. Pictures underwater. Lighting that showed off the splendour of the human figure. I have a letter from Lord... Beresford of Chatham House supporting my work. It came to nothing. No one gave me the money I needed to develop these inventions. Instead, it was Rome all over again. My uncouth landlord and a gross workman pulled me from my bed. I resisted, hanging onto the bedpost with all my strength, and threw me into the street. Not 
for the first time and not for the last, I was homeless and penniless. Oh, Zildo, I am proud that the list of my enemies is long. Every honourable man has foes, men who promise devotion and practice betrayal. Beauclerc, a hair-brained degenerate priest, I worked two years for him, expressing beautiful and holy ideals on canvas. He sold my productions at fifteen hundred pounds. I said seven hundred would satisfy me, and from that sum I would donate to his church. How much did he give me? Fifty. Fifty! Who else? Benson, the Benozic Buntingford prelate. He begged me to be his co-author, but only to steal my talent and have the world acknowledge it as his own. My London lawyers. Their ineptitude has deprived me of my rightful income for years. Dawkins, that blubber-lipped professor of Greek who abandoned me in Venice and who now has the effrontery to congratulate me on one of my poems. Lane, Richards, Sprigg, all those publishers and agents who have taken my manuscripts and given little or nothing in return. The worst of them, Sant. An evil man, a socialist, a man who expects to be paid for doing no work. Unlike me, a man who never stops working and who is never paid. Sant takes the truth and moulds it into lies, lies that the world believes. Most men are blind fools, unable to see reason, but Sant is as cunning as a fox. He sees reason and spits in its face, a blackmailer who libels and slanders me. But what do my enemies matter? They have got fat while I have starved, but have they brought me to my knees? No! I am still here. It is they who have fallen by the wayside. They failed to understand they were dealing with an extraordinary man. A man who would not plane his prominences down to fit the world's narrow grooves. A man who always has been, always will be better than them. I have many enemies. But what I need, Zildo, is a friend. The divine friend. The friend whose beauty shines from body and soul, whose soul responds to mine. The body certainly has its pleasures, Zildo, but they are nothing compared to the pleasures of the soul. It is true that when I was young I indulged my body, but I steered clear of passionate liaisons that burned too bright and too brief. Nicholson was not the only boy who longed for my affection but offered too little in return. As I grew older, many strangers appeared like deceiving shadows in the morning mist. John Holden, a wondrous beauty. We could, we should, have been flint and steel, but he stole my papers and threatened my life. Haddon, he was burdened with a wife and children, but he offered me his loyalty until death. He was another who stole my writings, but not my heart. Douglas, Caliban, both claimed me as their soulmates, and both proved false when they could not bend me to their will. A woman, Zildo? Why should I want a woman? A woman's form nauseates. Oh, vapid bunchiness and vacuous patchworkiness. 
Women are for the dull and mindless, not for men of genius. Men whose vision encompasses the world and beyond. Yet women never cease to plague and pester me, particularly here in Venice. The rag who nagged her Erastian husband to scrape acquaintance with me at the Hotel Bellevue. The Pash who has spent years trying to weave me into her web. The blousy Van Someren who shrieked with horror when she saw reality revealed in the writings she insisted I give her. Worst of all, that harpy Gleason White's wife who blithely sent her children to bed so she could lunge at me wearing the most violent violet dressing gown. I spurned her, and she has never forgiven me for her failure to lure me into sin. Only one woman, Zildo, has ever understood me. Caroline, Duchess of Sforza Cesarini, my patron, my benefactress. She bestowed my title, the Baron Corvo of Rome. She supported my talent. Yet even she, in the end, abandoned me. Never, ever trust a woman. Or a man, Zildo. Everyone abandons me or turns against me. They steal my paintings, my writings, my livelihood, and offer me charity in return. Charity. I accept no one's charity. I accept only what is due to me or nothing at all. I may be poor in money, but I am rich in spirit, and that makes me richer than any man. Richer, too, because I have you, Zildo. Emengildo Vianello, strong and handsome 17-year-old son of a shoemaker. My friend. My only friend. Poor like me but rich in beauty and strength and honesty, and loyal, ever loyal to me. But where are you, Zildo? There is work for you. The boat must be repaired. There will be letters for you to deliver. The soles of my shoes... I should have been a painter... But thanks to that Dambo clerk, I lost all my apparatus and was reduced to a state of penury. <laughs> I turned to writing, a loathsome occupation, because literature was the only outlet which Catholics left me. And oh, I have so much to say. It would make me rich if it were not for the publishers and agents and lawyers and layabouts who have all conspired to deprive me of my dues. What books I have written, Zildo. Stories of young Italians as innocent and wise as you. The history of the Borgias, the greatest family that Italy ever knew. Tales of centuries past. Poetry. What has it brought me, Zildo? Nothing. All my efforts have made others rich, not me. From one book alone, The Commercial Future of Rhodesia, I should have made two thousand sterling. But I lost it all and more to the military moron who published my work under his name. With that money, I could have lived like a doge on the Grand Canal instead of huddled in my boat on winter nights or shivering in this miserable room in a crumbling palace where the wind blows night and day. No matter. I would have given it all up for the church. The happiest day of my life was when I was received into the faith. 
It should have been when I became a priest, but my vocation, given by God, was denied to me by jealous Pharisees who could not accept that a man of my abilities should be granted the privileges that they enjoyed. Monsignor James Campbell, the Reverend William Rooney, Bishop Hugh MacDonald of Aberdeen, and many, many more were deaf to God's command. God's command, not mine. A roll of infamy that will echo down the ages. What good I could have done the church. Make me not just a priest, not even a cardinal. Make me pope and I would cleanse the church of the hypocrites and toads and moneylenders. As Pope, I would restore the faith to the lands where it was forgotten, bring order out of the chaos that threatens all Europe. Instead of which, I was forced into spiritual exile. I have always found the faith comfortable, but the faithful intolerable. Almost every Catholic a sedulous ape, a treacherous snob, a slanderer, an oppressor, or a liar. I never relinquished my right to be a priest. I never accepted it. I never acquiesced in it. I never will accept it. I never will acquiesce in it. I gave twenty years of my life to the church. For two decades my body was my temple and I kept it spotless. In England it was not difficult. The young men there are mostly dull brutes with thick faces, heavy bodies and lumbering walks. You see some on the banks of the Serpentine with handsome faces and intelligent eyes, lithe bodies and graceful movements, but they are few. Fewer still are those who accept another man's touch without squeals of horror or delight. Italy, Zildo, is different. Here the boys and young men are filled with life, devoid of the cant that burdens English souls. And in this city, where everyone swims from the cradle and almost every man rows, you see everywhere keen, prompt eyes, noble, firm necks, opulent shoulders, stalwart arms, magnificent torsos, lively muscular bodies inserted in well-compacted hips, long, slim, sinewy legs, everywhere images of the immortal youth to which Hellas once gave diadems. Oh, Zildo, you young Venetians share your bodies with such joy and insouciance you find pleasure in the pleasure you give. The wisest among you deal only with men. You know that the brothel brings only poverty and disease, while the games you play with friends or the favours you grant foreigners bring gifts and delight. Of course you practice with each other so that when you find a new friend, one who is older, wiser in the ways of the world and generous, you can show him all the tricks you have learned. But a priest must, must choose between the body of men and the body of Christ. And as a priest, in faith if not in name, it wasn't always easy to resist temptation. More than once I found myself in a quiet corner with a smiling face above a straight-necked, one-eyed serpent beckoning me. Toca, the boy would say. Toca, per cosa no toca, the boy would laugh. Why not touch it? Se divertente! It's fun! There was only innocence in their hearts, a wish to share with others the pleasure they had found for themselves. But for a priest, the devil lurked in those bright eyes. So I would smile, no grazie, and they would shrug as they pulled up their britches. No importa, genetze altri. Of course there were always others who would accept their invitation. 
They remained my friends, all of them, Carlo, Fausto, Piero, Giuseppe, and the others. The young gondoliers straining at the oar, young stevedores staggering down gangplanks bearing heavy burdens, their young muscular bodies smeared with the aroma of flour or the dust of coal. They see me for who I am, an honest man, an upright man who cares nothing for the opinion of hypocrites, the kind of man they hope they will have the courage to be. You wouldn't find boys like those in London, Zildo. The youth of England have been tainted by the vices of sloth and avarice, lured to destruction by money and women. Here in Venice there is only the purifying sea and air which wafts away the stink of babbling tourists. Heaven help La Serenissima if more tourists come, if more and more spill out of the Grand Canal and into the surrounding streets with their cameras and chatter. They will destroy this city. I came alive in Venice, Zildo. Sono rinato a Venezia. Beauty surrounds us here, beauty and history, peace and solitude. Although there is more peace and solitude on the waters of the lagoon than in the streets and churches. I am a Venetian, Zildo, sono veneziano, almost as Venetian as you are. I have swum in the waters in the coldest of winters. I am a member of the Bucintoro, and my prowess as a gondoliere is recognized by all. I have explored every inlet of the lagoon in my bark, seen the sun rise from La Salute, and seen it set from the shores of Burano. There have been days when I have had no tobacco, when the Alps have been covered with snow and the wind has brought perishing cold. I have walked all night through deserted streets, shivered sleepless on the boat or covered by one thin blanket, hunkered down in servants' quarters with no privacy or heating arrangements whatsoever. I have almost died of cold and hunger for the want of proper clothes, light and warmth, beef and wine. I do not blame Venice, Zildo. Every one of my torments has been imposed by my enemies. Venice's beauty has offered solace in return. As always, I have survived, Zildu, and see the luxury I am in. A roof over my head, my papers around me, my tobacco and cigarettes. Bring me matches, Zildu. I, I, I need... Where are you, boy? Do not test my patience too far. If you stay away too long, there are others who could take your place. No, not Carlo, poor... Carlo with only one ball, but Piero is always willing. Or Amadeo, love of God, the boy who showed me his beauty in the wine shop off the Rio Malcontento. Muscles as smooth as satin and a yard like a rose-tipped lance. And who could take my yard in every position, who would lie in my arms and urge me to kiss and kiss. Oh, how he could kiss. If not him, there are many, Zildo, that could take your place. Not the young ones. They are not yet ripe, and I will not give in, no matter how they pester me. Besides, it is not a boy I want, a playmate, but a companion. A young man ready to share life's adventures. The divine friend. For a time I thought you were he. But it is too late. There is no divine friend. There is only the divine. My Lord, I could serve you so well. Your church is in the hands of fops and fools. You are betrayed by the man who skulks in St. Peter's Basilica, bemoaning the loss of the last of papal land, unable to see that the temporal power weakens the church. 
It only has authority when it is as poor as the widow who gave her last night. The world lacks a spiritual leader. It lurches towards war. France has fallen into atheism, Russia into chaos, Austria-Hungary collapses and Germany seeks room to breathe. England stands aloof, brings civilization to far-off lands, but it will never shirk its duty if called upon by its neighbours. Only the Church can steer these powers from the path of conflict, and it can only do so when the shoes of the fishermen are filled by a man who has only the good of men at heart, who can see clearly when others are blinded by ignorance and ambition. Give me the power, O Lord! Make me a priest! More! Give me the keys that you gave Peter, the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Zilda, ah. oh. 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 you have come back. God be thanked. Oh. Oh. Help me to my chair. Oh. Oh. I, I, I... Your eminences, you have us at a disadvantage. We were... We must have been asleep. What was the subject of our discussion? Ah, yes. Since your eminences plucked us from the impoverishment into which you had thrust us and saw fit to elect us Pope, it has been our duty and our prerogative to have around us men of integrity. It is, therefore, our pleasure to appoint Signor Emingildo Vianello to the office of Papal Chamberlain. We trust you will offer Signor Vianello the same respect and assistance that you offer ourself. Come, Zildo, sit, sit, sedi, sedi. We notice eminences that you do not all approve. Since we were elected, it has pleased us to take note of your reactions to our decisions. We respect your differing viewpoints, but remind you of the authority you have vested in us. It is our wish that we have beside us our friend, our divine friend. Meanwhile, your eminences, it has come to our notice... It has come to our notice that certain persons are hostile to us. We do not mean such esteemed men as their gracious majesties the King of Italy or the German Kaiser. As you know, we have begun discussions with them which will, we are sure, bear the fruits of peace. No, we talk of men who knew Rolf, Frederick Rolf, the Baron Corvo. Men and women corrupted by the poison of failure. Failure to live honest lives. Failure to overcome the sins of pride and jealousy. Men like Sant, who stand now with Satan. Men whose jealousy will destroy them. We do not fear such people, but these men and women accuse Frederick Rove of sin. They call him lazy, luxurious, debauched, a Jesuitical Machiavellian, a pretentious ignoramus, a liar, a fraud, and more. Many of these accusations are libelous, but we confess that Frederick Rofe was not a saint. He was guilty of many sins, as we, Hadrian, are guilty today. We struggle daily with the demons of pride and anger. But Frederick Rofe stands accused of mortal sin. God will judge Frederick Rofe, but we as priest and pontiff never have and never would commit such a sin. We can only hope that those who confuse the man who was the weak, friendless, often starving man who had only his pride and integrity to clothe his spirit... We hope that they never confuse that man who no longer exists with the humble representative of Christ before you now. 
Your evidence says we cannot hear you if all talk at once. We will discuss this another time. Now, give us leave to retire. It pleases us to walk in our gardens. Chamberlain Zildo, give us your arm. Eminences, you crowd us. Look around you, Zildo. See those we have summoned to Rome. The Japanese emperor talking to the king of Portugal the young king of Spain and the president of America, the British king and the German Kaiser, Prince Filiberto, a handsome boy, still half-child and none of his father's reserve, but he will serve Italy well, and peace will come. At our behest, these men have set aside their differences. They are working together for the common good. A new world is on the horizon. So many people, Zilda, come to Rome. They have come to see us. Begging, clamouring, falling to their knees. Begging forgiveness from ourselves for their wrongs and calumnies to Frederick Rofe. Benson and Beauclerc, Haddon and Holden and Piddy Gordon, Lane and Richards and all the scribblers and publishers and agents, boarding house keepers and gossiping wives, suspicious aunts and posturing prelates. They hated us, but we forgive them. We forgive them all, Zilda. Even the woman in the violet dressing gown. There is such love and desire and pain in her eyes, such unhappiness. Beside her, a man whose face is burning with anger, Sant. We offer him forgiveness, but he cannot accept it. He would rather destroy us. He raises his arm to greet us. No, he has a gun. Zildo, we need you now. Come to us. Benedicat te omnipotens Deus. Pray for the repose of our soul. We are so tired. That was John Vernon in Now We Are Pope, written by Martin Foreman. Hear more drama and fiction, old and new, on arbreproductions.co.uk.